theoretical physics. What does that make you think of? <laughs> maybe you had physics in school, or maybe you think of one of the greats like Albert Einstein. Maybe you think of fundamental particles, the elementary building blocks of our universe. I'm a theoretical physicist, and, and I think of these things, but I spend an awful lot of time thinking about knots. What I usually want to know about knots is whether one knot is the same or different from another knot. What I mean by this is can the knot on the right be twisted and turned around and turned into the knot on the left without cutting, without using scissors? If you can do this, we say they're equivalent knots, and otherwise we say they're inequivalent. Surprisingly enough, this question of equivalence of knots is very important for certain types of fundamental particles. Furthermore, it's important for the future of technology. This is what I'm going to tell you in the next 15 minutes. To get started, we need some of the results from relativity. Now, relativity is a pretty complicated subject, and I'm not going to explain much of it. But one of the themes that we learn from it is that space and time are mostly the same thing. So I have a little story to tell to explain this. It's a story of Einstein's world and his day. So we have his home, his work, his cinema on the screen, and there's a clock in the upper right-hand corner. So keep your eye on the clock during the day. So Einstein starts his day, he goes to work, then after a while he comes home for lunch, clock keeps ticking, he goes back to work, clock keeps ticking. In the afternoon, he decides to go to the cinema, goes to the cinema, clock keeps ticking, and then eventually he goes home. Well, a physicist would look at this and would want to treat time more similarly as space. And the way we do this is we plot space on an axis and we plot time on another axis. Einstein's so-called world line is this dark red line which tells you where in space is he at any given time. It's called his world line because it tells you where in the world is he at any given time. Now we can go through the day and keep your eye on the dark red ball. The ba ball goes up one step every hour as we go through the day. It goes back and forth in space tracing Einstein's position. So the world line is just a convenient way of keeping track of where Einstein is at any point in the day. We can do the same thing with a more complicated world. So here we imagine looking down on Einstein's neighborhood from a helicopter above. So Einstein starts his day at home, he goes to work, he goes to the cinema, he goes back home. A student on the same day starts at home, goes to the library, goes to the pub, and goes home. Now, if we follow them both on the same day, Einstein goes to work, student goes to the library, Einstein goes to the cinema, student goes to the pub, Einstein goes home, student goes home, it starts to look pretty complicated. But we can simplify it by looking at the space-time diagram of what happened. We do that by turning the neighborhood sideways, plotting time vertically, and you'll notice I've drawn a blue vertical line at the position of every object in the neighborhood that doesn't move, such as the library or the pub. They stay fixed in space and they move through time. Einstein and the students' world lines move around in the neighborhood as they go through time. Now you can kind of see where I'm going with this. Einstein and the students' world lines have wrapped around each other. If you pull those tight, you'll discover that you have them knotted. Now we need one more thing from the theory of relativity. We need E equals mc squared. Again, this is a thing that I'm not going to explain to you in much depth, but roughly what it means is that energy and mass are the same thing. So if we have a particle in our world, like an electron, that's a particle of matter. Now each particle of matter has an opposite particle of antimatter. In the case of an electron, the antimatter particle is called a positron. Both the electron and the positron have mass. If you bring them together, however, they can annihilate each other, giving off their mass as energy, usually as light energy. The process works in reverse just as well. You can put in the energy and get out the massive particles. Now, we're going to do the same thing we did with Einstein's neighborhood. We're looking down at a neighborhood. We put in energy to create a particle and an antiparticle. We put in energy to create a particle and an antiparticle. Then maybe we move one particle around another, we bring them back together, we re-annihilate them, and re-annihilate them, releasing the energy again. Now, if we look at that in a space-time diagram, it looks a little bit like this. Time running vertically, we put in the energy, we put in the energy, we wrap one particle around the other, and we annihilate them, and we annihilate them again. And you can see quite clearly here that the world lines have knotted around each other. Do the same thing with more particles by putting in more energy, move them around in some very complicated way, and bring them back together. 
The space-time diagram would look a little bit like this, making a very complicated knot. Now, here's the amazing fact upon which the rest of my talk relies. Certain particles called anions exist in 2 plus 1 dimensions. Now, I should probably say what I mean by 2 plus 1 dimensions. Two dimensions mean because we're talking about a flat surface. So these particles live on flat surfaces. When we say plus one dimensions, we mean also time. So we're just saying that the particles on the flat surface move around in time. So these particles called anions exist, where the properties at the end depend on the space-time knot that their world lines have formed. So you can kind of see now why I'm so concerned with whether two knots are the same or whether they're different. We can conduct an experiment by which we create some particles, move them around to form a knot, and then they have some property at the end of the knot. Then we do the experiment again, create the particles, make another knot, and I want to know whether the properties of the particles at the end of the knot are the same as the properties of the particles at the end of a different knot. This is why I'm concerned with whether knots are the same or whether they're different. Now, just looking at these two simple knots, it may not be obvious that sometimes it's hard to tell if two knots are the same or they're different. Is there some way to unravel one and turn it into the other without cutting? Fortunately, mathematicians have been thinking about this problem for over 100 years, and they've cooked up some important tools to help us distinguish knots from each other. The most important tool is known as a knot invariant. A knot invariant is an algorithm that takes as an input a picture of a knot and gives us an output some mathematical quantity, a number, a polynomial, some mathematical expression, some mathematical symbols. The important thing about a knot invariant is that equivalent knots, two knots that can be deformed into each other without cutting, have to give the same output. So if I have two knots, I don't know if they're the same or not, I put them into the algorithm. If they give two different outputs, I know immediately that they can't be deformed into each other without cutting, that they're fundamentally different knots. Now, in order to show you how these things work, I'm actually going to show you how to calculate a knot invariant. The problem here is I have to give you a warning that there's going to be math. Now, I've given this talk at high schools before, and, and nobody died. So, <laughs> so I suspect most people can handle the amount of math that we're going to do. But I know some people are very math-phobic, like the person in that slide. And if that's you, just close your eyes when you get scared, open them up later, and everything will be OK. You won't miss too much. So the knot invariant we're going to consider is known as the Kaufman invariant, or the Jones invariant. And we start with a number, which we call A. A stands for a number, in this case. So the first rule of the, of the Kaufman invariant is that if you ever have a loop of string, a simple loop with nothing going through it, we can replace that loop with the algebraic combination minus A squared minus 1 over A squared. And that combination occurs frequently, so we call it D. So anyway, the first rule is then, if you ever have a loop of string with nothing going through it, you can replace that loop with just the number d. The second rule is a harder rule. This rule says that if you have two strings that cross over each other, you can replace the picture with the two strings crossing over each other with the sum of two pictures. In the first picture, the strings go vertically. In the second picture, the strings go horizontally. The first picture gets a coefficient of a out front, and the second picture gets a coefficient of 1 over a out front. Now, this may look very puzzling, because we've replaced a picture with a sum of two pictures, and we've put numbers in front of those pictures. So now we're talking about adding pictures together, as well as putting numbers in front of our pictures. But all we're doing is we're doing math with pictures, and I'll show you that it's not that hard by actually doing a calculation. What we're going to do is we're going to take our rules, and we're going to apply them to a very simple knot. This very simple knot, this figure eight looking thing, well, secretly we know that it's actually just a loop of string, and we folded it over to make it look like a figure eight. But suppose we didn't know that. Suppose we weren't so clever to figure out that we could just unfold it and make it into a simple loop. We would go ahead and try to calculate the Kaufman knot invariant by following the algorithm. So what you do is you look at the knot, and you discover that two strings are crossing over each other. So I've circled that in that red box. Now, within that red box, we have two strings crossing over each other. So we can apply the rule and replace those two strings crossing over each other with a sum of two pictures. In the first, the two strings go vertical. In the second, the two strings go horizontal. In the first, you have a coefficient of a out front. In the second, you have a coefficient of 1 over a out front. Now we just fill in the rest of the knot exactly like it is over on the left. So now we replaced one picture by a sum of two pictures with appropriate coefficients. Now, in these pictures, there are still crossings uh, in the knot down below, where I've uh, now indicated them in blue. 
And we have to apply the Kaufman rule to these crossings as well, which we do exactly the same way. And now we have a sum of four diagrams with appropriate coefficients. At this point, we've gotten rid of all of the crossings, and we're left with only simple loops. And simple loops, by the first rule, get a value of d. So each time we have a loop, we replace it by a factor of d. So in the first picture, for example, there's two loops, so it gets d squared. The second picture is just one big loop, so it's a factor of d, and so forth. At this point, we are now down to only symbols. There are no pictures left. So we have a's and d's. So it's just some algebra at this point. So we combine together some terms. Then we use the definition of d being minus a squared minus 1 over a squared to replace this by a minus d. We get a d cubed canceling a minus d cubed. And at the end of the day, we get d. Yay. So <laughs> this is, why does this get yay? This is exciting for two reasons. First of all, it's exciting because this is the end of the math. The second reason it's exciting is because of the result giving us d. The reason it's interesting that we get d is because at the beginning, what we actually started with was just a simple loop. We folded it over to make it look like a figure eight, but it was a simple loop. And the Kaufman invariant of a simple loop is just d. Now, even though we folded it over to make it look more complicated, when we went through this algorithm, at the end of the day, we get d. That's how not invariants work. We could have folded it over 100 times and made it look incredibly complicated, but still, it would have given us d. So if we have these two knots here, and we want to know if they're the same or different, we put them into the algorithm, and we get out two different algebraic results. These results don't equal each other, and so we know immediately that these two knots are fundamentally different. They cannot be turned into each other without cutting the strands. So if someone gives you this knot, you might say, well, go ahead, follow the algorithm, and see what comes out. Unfortunately, Kaufman invariants are exponentially hard to calculate. What do I mean by that? Well, in this picture here, we had two crossings. We ended up with four diagrams. Each time we had to evaluate a crossing, we doubled the number of diagrams. If we had had three crossings, we would have had eight diagrams. Four crossings, we would have had 16 diagrams, and so forth and so on. So in, an, in this knot, we have about 100 crossings, which would be 2 to 100 diagrams. And that number is so enormous that the world's largest computer would take over 100 years to be able to evaluate the Kaufman invariant of this knot. So you might think, well, if I have a complicated knot, evaluating the Kaufman invariant maybe isn't that interesting after all. But let's go back to this amazing fact that these particles called anions exist, where their properties at the end depend on the space-time knot that their world lines have formed. What does that mean? Well, precisely, the probability that the particles will annihilate at the end of the knot is proportional to the Kaufman invariant of the knot squared. So if I had these anions, by measuring whether they annihilate, I can estimate, I can measure the Kaufman invariant of a complicated knot. The way you do it is you produce your anions, you move them around to make this complicated knot, and then you try to annihilate, and you see if they annihilate. You do it many, many, many times, so you get a very good estimate of exactly what the probability of annihilation is. And so you've measured the Kaufman invariant of this knot. Why is that interesting? Well, the reason it's interesting is because these Kaufman invariants are exponentially hard to calculate. The world's biggest computer would not be able to calculate the Kaufman invariant of that knot even in 100 years. But these anions can do it. These anions can solve this exponentially hard problem. Now, that's kind of an interesting thing to know, just sort of fundamentally, that these particles have a way of calculating something that our biggest computers still can't do. But maybe we're not so interested in calculating the Kaufman invariant of a knot. It turns out that this anion computer can do the same calculations as any so-called quantum computer can do. Now, I'm not going to explain what a quantum computer is, but roughly, a quantum computer is a type of computing device that uses the odd properties of quantum mechanics to do calculations that modern computers essentially cannot do at all. This particular type of quantum computer that uses anions and knots is known as a topological quantum computer because it uses the topology of the knots to do the computation. Now, I will give you one short example of the other kind of things that quantum computers can do. Conventional computers, even your, your mobile phone, are very good at multiplication. If I give the, a, a computer or your phone these two very large numbers and I ask it to multiply it together, in less than a millisecond, it would come back with that super huge number as a result. On the other hand, if I gave you this super huge number and asked you to find the two factors 
find the two numbers, which one multiplied together would give you the super huge number, it would take about 50 years of computer time. A quantum computer goes forward and backwards in roughly the same amount of time. This is the kind of thing quantum computers can do. Specific calculations that modern computers are unable to do efficiently, quantum computers can do very well. There is a catch. The catch is that no one's built a quantum computer. <laughs> but this is what people are working on. People like myself and, and other computer scientists, physicists, and mathematicians are quite interested in, in building these things in the next few years. This is why we're interested in knots, world lines, and quantum computation. Thank you.